All right, welcome uh, to everyone and thank you so much for joining us. Um, uh, we just finished our first session, uh, which highlighted the importance of telling the stories of our elders as a way of placing them and our disciplines in historical context um, and understanding really some of the work that has come before. Um, this workshop is going to emphasize uh, the labor of learning the skills to accomplish that task. I'm Anjali Botts. I am one of the co-organizers for this conference. Um, I will be moderating this session. I want to start by talking a little bit about what we're going to, what work we're going to do. I will pass to our speakers, and then hopefully we can have a really interactive conversation. Um, I, if you were in the previous session, you know that there is a Discord channel, which I will share the link to um, shortly. So um, I, I think that um, our speakers on the first panel alluded to this, that theory is all good and well, um, but it's only so useful when it is not accompanied by the practical. So whether we think about this in terms of the ethical commitment to those around us, whether we think about what intellectual honesty means with respect to the communities that we are invested in, or whether we're thinking about survival for ourselves, um, the theory has to be able to translate into practice. And so one of the goals of this conference is to think collaboratively about how the theory that we speak about in the seminars can be, can be transformed into practical skills. And one of the themes that came up was uh, in the first session was the extra labor of being a person of color in the academy. Uh, this idea that we're not necessarily trained for the work that we are asked to do, um, that suddenly when we get to the academy, we are activists and DEI uh, laborers and uh, shepherds of the students of color that come through. And um, we don't always have the resources to speak about that. So um, as I mentioned earlier, one of the struggles of doing social justice work is maintaining a hold on histories and memories. Archives aren't always forthcoming, recollections can become fuzzy and connections are lost. If we're lucky as junior faculty, uh, mentors, colleagues and collaborators will help us get the lay of the land, so to speak, but that is not a guarantee nor is it a certainty. Thinking about how power operates in the spaces in which we move, where it's located and how we can productively interact with it while respecting those who already did or are doing this work is of paramount importance. What we wanna to emphasize today uh, is a spirit of coalitional politics with the acknowledgement that sometimes coalitions are not possible. Derek Bell helpfully speaks of the idea of interest convergence as those moments in which the political desires of different groups intersect. Now, interest convergence can produce progressive change, but that change is not always durable or long lasting. Nonetheless, it is a starting point for thinking about strategies for building uh, coalitions that are sustainable and progressive work that is sustainable. Um, I wanna start by introducing our two speakers. Before I do that, um, I wanna direct your attention to uh, our website, which has the introductory video. Um, there's, you will find on the website a whole variety of resources um, and details about the conference, um, including our recording policy. We are recording this session um, and the details of our recording policy are on the website. You can find also uh, the organizing principles and themes of the conference. Some information about our uh, co-organizers and also our land acknowledgement um, uh, posture and uh, the work that we're doing in that respect. Um, the, uh, so I want to say a huge thank you to our, uh, our two speakers for, for being here together. They have quite a lot of experience in the field. Uh, they're each going to speak for some time, about 15 to 20 minutes, and then we'll have uh, a, a good chunk of time for questions. Um, I ask that with respect, to, with, with respect to questions that you type them in the question box um, or that you indicate that you have a question um, and I can unmute you. My hope uh, is that we will be able to have uh, an intimate conversation. We have um, a, a relatively 
manageable group of people. So um, feel free to get into the conversation and follow along. As I said, there's also a Discord channel, which I think quite a few people from the first session have found and contributed to. So that's going to be open for the entirety of the con conference for all 14 events. What were we thinking? Uh, this is going to last a long time. And so I think there will be some converse time for those conversations uh, to happen in depth. Our first speaker is Rupali Mukherjee, uh, who is Professor of Media Studies at Queens College CUNY. Um, she is a critical race scholar of media. She is the author of two books, The Blacking Factory Brand Culture and the Technologies of the Racial Self, um, which I am very excited about, and The Racial Order of Things, uh, Cultural Imaginaries of the Post-Soul Era. She is also the co-editor of Racism Post-Race, which we certainly need to talk about in this moment, and Commodity Activism, Cultural Resistance in Neoliberal Times. Uh, Mukherjee teaches undergraduate courses on media criticism and activist media and graduate courses on cultural studies, research methods, and social justice. So welcome, and thank you so much for joining us. Our second speaker is Ankharad Valdivia, who is research professor of, uh, at the Institute of Communications Research and Media and Cinema Studies at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Uh, her, uh, she is also, excuse me, uh, inaugural head of media and uh, cinema studies and past director of the Institute of Communications Research from 2009 to 2014. She publishes on transnationalism, gender and popular culture. Um, and her books include A Latina in the Land of Hollywood, Feminism, Multiculturalism and the Media, um, a book that I think is, is so important to our field. Um, a Companion to Media Studies, uh, Latina and Latino Communication Studies Today, Mapping Latina and Latino Studies, and Latina, Latinos in the and the Media. She edited Communication Theory and the International Encyclopedia of Media Studies in 2012 and 2013, um, and a seven volume full length article in Psych Encyclopedia with Wiley Blackwell. We are so thrilled to have you here today with both of your um, expertise. And um, with that, I'm gonna pass uh, the microphone to you, the metaphorical microphone, and uh, we will then move on to the Q&A. All right. Hello, everybody. I don't see you, but I know you're there. Um, so I'm Rupali, I'm very happy to be here. Um, the opening panel was pretty awesome. Uh, and I'm hoping that there'll be nice um, cross-pollinations, um, not just between the earlier panel and today, but from week to week. So Anjali asked us to think about um, power maps of the field and um, histories of the field. And, you know, a small task. Um, but what I thought I would do was I thought I would try my hand at a kind of tentative construction of a power map along a single thematic. And I thought I would focus on institutional classifications um, that define our workspaces and geographies and our capacities to move and maneuver within them. So I'm gonna approach, I'm, I'm thinking about power maps somewhat literally as space and geography, as well as location <clears throat> and position. Uh, I'm thinking um, of power maps or maps in the sense of standpoint and standing, standing room, standing ground, you know, uh, down that line. I'm also gonna try and do something that I normally do not count as part of my uh, intellectual, public intellectual toolkit. And that is, I'm gonna track anecdotal elements from my own career as they embed, <clears throat> as they embed these power maps. Um, I'm gonna do this with an important disclaimer. I am not offering my choices or my decisions as models. Uh, I am not outlining some kind of winning formula for others to follow. I'm making no claim that my decisions <laughs> have been prudent or wise or even sensible, um, but I'm trying to offer a um, phenomenal lo logical map uh, kind of um, that draws on experience highlighting what I hope will do is highlight a set of encounters between power, hierarchy, and the possibilities of transformation. So first, the anecdote. Um, <clears throat> I wanna start with my decision in 2001. While I was still on the tenure track 
and just back to the rural Midwest after a postdoc on the West Coast. Um, and I made a decision uh, when I returned to the Midwest to go back out onto the job market. I applied for two jobs and I got one. The offer I received and which I later accepted meant leaving a research one institution for something else. Um, many well-meaning colleagues at the job I was leaving could not understand my decision. Largely, there was astonishment. How can someone leave Research One? Can someone leave Research One? Less generous onlookers whispered that my leaving could only mean that there was something gravely wrong with my scholarship, my standing with me. A few people asked me directly, voices duly lowered, if I had been denied tenure or if I was about to be denied tenure. Nothing else could explain why I was leaving Research One. Initially, I tried to provide some explanation. Later, I didn't bother. There were simply too many people for whom the decision to leave meant only a fall from grace. To leave R1, whether voluntarily or not, was surely career suicide. The truth is I did not have a good idea of what it meant. There was a lot I did not understand about the consequences of my decision to leave R1. All I knew with unshakable certainty was that I had to leave. And these reasons were such that they were louder in my head than any doubts and misgivings I might have had. 20 years later, I now know that it was a decision with enormous significance, a decision that continues to exact a significant price and which no one should make lightly. What kind of price? One, I teach more, or more accurately, I do things to get out of teaching more. Either way, ultimately, I have less time to read and less time to write. Two, I have access to fewer resources, research budgets, conference funds, teaching assistants, administrative assistants. Three, there is the brand taint of a non-research one university. Think here about R1 administrators for whom any promotion I receive re remains less worthy than the one they could have conferred on me. Or R1 colleagues unsure about my credentials for writing tenure letters or more justifiably about my resource capacities for fundraising or glam conferencing. Finally, perhaps most significantly, my decision to leave R1 has meant that I work at an institution with a smaller financial cushion. This, of course, is in part because my students are predominantly working class and first generation college attending. They are immigrants and people of color, the children of NYC cabbies, restaurant workers, social workers, school teachers. In the context of a relentless neoliberal push toward budget cuts, hiring freezes, and ad adjunctification, which no doubt we are all encountering, it came up in the previous panel, uh, we are all encountering no matter where we are. Some of us, some of our students, have fewer layers of protection from the institutional impacts of financial exigency. So while my university does a pretty good job of delivering upward mobility and class transcendence for many of my students, it also normalizes resource poverty and cutting corners as standard operating procedures. It resignifies making do, and more recently, doing more with less um, as ethical triumphs, as if these things were both necessary and sufficient for educating working class people of color. Now, I'm fairly certain that this, despite these costs, I have in fact managed to get some work done and that some of this work has managed to be useful to a number of people. And so I am often confronted by the odd reality of my own academic celebrity. The truth is that I'm glad that many of you know my name and read my work. I also know that I am sort of an anomaly. I am often one of only a handful of scholars Sometimes I am the only scholar representing an institution that is not research one, who gets invited to keynote a conference, to serve on editorial boards, 
in divisional leadership, on doctoral committees, and most importantly for me personally, in the mentoring of junior women of color. Now, none of this means that I am not fully committed to doing whatever I can to get scholars of color hired and tenured at Research One institutions. Better me and my people in there than outside. But these jobs are few and far between, and they come with other costs, including, as several of the organizers of this conference have pointed out, the costs of participating in the institutional packaging and commodification of our own otherness and alterity, and of circulating within a scholarly marketplace that tokenizes and capitalizes on difference as essential to their brand value and maybe also ours. The point I want to make is that there is a whole terrain of institutional classification that defines our workspaces and geographies and a whole matrix of taxonomy and hierarchy and exclusivity that impacts our capacities to move and maneuver within these spaces and geographies. So I thought it might be worthwhile to take a few minutes to map out, if only an outline, the meaning and significance of institutional systems that invent categories like R1 as opposed to everything else. It might be useful, I was thinking, to trace out the systems and structures that render these classifications and taxonomies credible and true. I'm asking, I guess, how we might map this out, how mapping this out rather helps us talk about the possibilities of transformation given the stakes of these classificatory systems, as my own career suggests. How might such a map allow us to think critically about the power of these classification systems, certainly, but also how, does it, how do they allow us to talk about fugitivity, whatever that might mean within these systems? So to consider such a map. My apologies before I start to my non-US colleagues here, much of what I'm about to do pertains specifically to the United States, maybe a little bit of Canada. Um, <clears throat> Although I would be very keen to hear, because you know there are comparable maps in uh, reflecting other parts of the uh, scholarship in the other parts of the world. Um, apologies also for the simplifications that I have needed to make so as not to go on forever in talking about the details that I'm about to get into. So a map, a map that is um, that gives us institutional classifications. There are three leading frameworks for classifying U.S. colleges and universities. The Carnegie Classification of Institutions of Higher Education, that's one. The Association of American Universities, which has a list of research universities, that's the second. The Center for Measuring University Performance, which publishes something called the TARU reports, the T-A-R-U reports, which stands for the Top American Research University Reports. The Carnegie classification originally published in 1973 and updated eight times since most recently in 2018 categorizes institutions of higher education into peer groups separating similar institutions into six main categories doctoral universities masters colleges and universities baccalaureate colleges associates colleges special focus institutions, and finally, tribal colleges. As you can understand, as you can imagine, this gets fairly detailed and complicated as we go. So I'm gonna do a very <clears throat> upper level skim on this. Doctoral universities, according to the 2018 Carnegie update, are institutions that confer at least 20 research or scholarship doctorates in a given year and which report at least $5 million in total research expenditures. Um, the 2018 update included within this category of doctoral universities, institutions that confer at least 30 professional practice doctoral degrees, JD, MD, PharmD, and so on. Within these, this broad category of doctoral institutions, Carnegie, has three subcategories. R1, um, very high research activity. There are, as of, 200, uh, as of 2018, 131 such institutions in the United States. R2, high research activity. 
and then a third category, doctoral uh, slash professional universities, D slash PU. Master's colleges, again, a threefold subcategory. These are institutions that award at least 50 master's degrees and fewer than 20 doctoral degrees. Uh, M1, large programs, M2, medium programs, and M3, smaller programs. Baccalaureate colleges, fewer than 50 master's degrees or 20 doctoral degrees, and baccalaureate or higher degrees representing at least 50% of all the degrees conferred. Associates, where the largest or the highest level of degree conferred is an associate's degree. Uh, special focus, a high concentration of degrees in a single field or a related set of fields, so all the polytechnics, the uh, institutes of art, so on, would go into special focus institutions unless they, they confer doctoral degrees, in which case they, they go into the R categories. And tribal colleges, members, um, colleges that are members of the American Indian Higher Education Consortium. So I have some things to share with you, which I'm going to put in the chat. For example, I'm going to share with you a PDF of the 2018 um, classification, the Carnegie classification. It's got lists and facts and figures. And then, um, sorry, I gave you the list first and here's the facts and figures if anybody's interested in pursuing this. Oh, hold on. Panelists and attendees, right? Um, I shared it. Okay, thank you. Um, and for anybody who's interested, there's anybody on this thing that doesn't know um, where they fit, Carnegie offers an interesting little lookup feature on their websites, and I'm also sharing the link to that. Because honestly, I did not know where the institution I currently teach at fit. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that's Carnegie. The second classification system is the Association of American Universities. Um, they started to publish this list of institutions starting in the year 1900, so a little before the SCA was founded. Uh, and in their own words, these are institutions, quote, on the leading edge of innovation, scholarship, and solutions that contribute to, that contribute to scientific progress, economic development, security, and well-being. So here is AAU's list of Research One institutions. At last count, the AAU included, included 63 research institutions in the United States and two in Canada. What the logics are for only covering the US and Canada is hard to know because it's not clearly not English speaking, it's clearly not North America. And because they only look, they only include institutions in the United States and, and Canada. Now, both the Carnegie classification and the AAU list are meant to be what are called nominal classifications, uh, but they are often taken to also be rankings or ordinal classifications. There are in fact important differences between the Carnegie system and the institutional rankings that are produced, for example, by the US News and World Report, best colleges rankings, the Shanghai Academic Ranking of World Universities, the Times Higher Education World University Rankings, there's a whole bunch of them all clearly giving us rankings. The Carnegie and AAU lists are not supposed to be rankings. The distinction being that classification is a method for apprehending the structure of a system and ranking a method for stimulating competition among those at a similar level in a system. Now, this distinction has been emphasized and re-emphasized throughout the Carnegie classification system's 45-year history. This, however, has not stopped universities from complaining when their status on the classification slips, as when in 2015, Dartmouth College was moved from R1 to R2. This has also not stopped universities from allocating big budgets to lobbying to move up the levels in the classification. 
Notable cases include Texas Tech, Temple, Kansas State. <clears throat> and here administration set aside explicit funding and research related goals to transition from R2 to R1 <clears throat> as required by the Carnegie classification. The University of Montana a few years later, the University of Idaho similarly oriented strategic efforts towards transitioning to R1. This of course is also true of institutions that are already in the R1 category where maintenance of that status is often a priority because it can be marketed as an indicator of high quality or I mean high ranking or quality. The third institutional classification system is produced by the Center for Measuring University Performance and is more self-consciously a ranking system. This is what produces those TARU reports. Um, I ran out of time, so I don't know a whole lot of detail about these things. There is, however, an additional, somewhat murkier, but no less significant classification matrix, which goes by the name of tier one. Now, tier one rests on recognition by either the Carnegie Foundation or the AAU or the Center for Measuring University Performance. And the classific classificatory uh, criteria here are much murkier, less elaborated. Um, and so depending on which classification you go by, the number changes. So according to the Carnegie classification, there are 105 tier one institutions in the US. By TARU standards, there are 73. And according to the AAU list, there are 63, which are the 63 US institutions on their list. Let us take from these details at least two insights. First, <clears throat> no matter that most of these classificatory inst institutions insist otherwise, the distinction between nominal and ordinal classification is theoretical at best. The one easily stands for the other. And two, as a consequence, classification is inseparable from hierarchy and competition. Things that I think we would all agree are in diametric opposition to the transformative work that we are committed to. And yet my point is not at all that the realities of these institutional systems of class classification mean that we are without opportunities for institutional transformation. Um, dipping once again, briefly, into my own experience, I will close today by highlighting one set of opportunities within the spaces and geographies that these classificatory systems construct for us. So in 2008, right when I was granted tenure, I was invited to join the administration of the Honors College. Now on principle, I am opposed to the idea of a separately tiered Honors College. Like charter schools, Honors Colleges drain resources keeping institutional support and resources on a select group of high achieving students at the cost of more equitably distributed university-wide budgetary allocations. But my invitation to join the honors administration came from white people who were concerned, some of them outraged about the fact that the honors college had until then brought in predominantly white, mostly Jewish cohorts of high achieving students. I was told quite openly by some of these people that I was being brought in to help change this and that I would be granted institutional resources to try and make a dent in the problem. Equally, however, joining the honors administration would reduce my teaching obligations down to a 2-2 load. And so my decision to assume my administrative position with the honors college is informed by profound ambivalences. It has allowed me, there is no question, to help distribute the resources of the Honors College among Black and Latinx high achieving students graduating from area high schools. And it has also provided me the means to defray some of the costs I have paid for being outside Research One. The point is that being at a resource poor university that does not enjoy any of the elite markers of the Carnegie or AAU classifications has been crucial to incentivizing my work toward this kind of institutional transformation. And that while these classifications define our workspaces and the geographies in powerful ways, they can, I think, also provide incentives and openings to move and maneuver precisely within them and because of them. Thank you. I will now invite 
Angie Valdivia. Thank you. I, um, first of all, I want to thank Anjali and the whole uh, organizing group for putting together this wonderful, wonderful opportunity for us to engage in discussions, to touch base because we cannot see each other in person and we are a community and, and, and you know, to forward the issue of transformation. Uh, as I start talking, and I will share my, my, uh, my PowerPoint. Uh, I also, I just wanted to say that as we were, I was listening to the previous panel, which was incredibly wonderful and coherent. You know, at first I didn't see how everything would go together, but everything went together just like a Montessori school. And uh, the fact that the Fugitive Academy, I was, you know, thinking about it, listening to, to uh, Rupali and the other scholars is that the Academy is fugitive. I mean, we're not the fugitives. I feel like I have created spaces of inclusion and those have been taken over and they've run away from me. So it's not just that we are fugitive, but that spaces of inclusion get taken over and we have to either create new ones or we have to run after them. And so that, that the fugitivity is on all sides, is on all sides. So at this point, I would like to share my screen. Uh, Somebody just let me know if you're seeing it, right? And let, let me make sure that I, I am at the, at the point where I wanna be with the PowerPoint and then I will share my screen. Uh, share screen. Um, share sound. Are we on something that looks like a PowerPoint? You're good. Yep. All right. So let me do that. So just kind of some comments about transforming the academy. So thanks for everything that everybody's done. I must confess that I did labor over this presentation quite a bit. And not because I have little experience on issues of the Fugitive Academy of trying to transform the academy, but rather because the way in which we kept discussing them, the genealogies of power, what we wish we had known, uh, just kind of paralyzed me in, uh, in digging into the micro as it informs the macro and in providing a method to navigate structures of power towards transformation. Also, I must confess that the neoliberal word deliverables, that kind of tripped me up. But, but I finally settled on doing a presentation that deals with uh, possibilities and power asymmetries in the university at large and then going into some specifics in the field. So hopefully this will be helpful to you. So yesterday, as I was once more going over notes, slides, and lists of questions sent to us by Anjali, this report pops up in my official university email. And uh, I, I shared the report with everybody on the chat. So you can all look at that report, it's open to everybody, okay? Um, the AAUP, Illinois Faculty Governance Survey 2019, prepared by the Shared Governance Committee of AAUP, Illinois. It was distributed by William Bernhardt, Vice Provost, Provost for Academic Affairs. Because I had nothing else to do at the time, slash, I had a million things to do and COVID mental fragmentation took over my brain, I accepted the clickbait and read the entire 32 page report. It had tons of graphs, so not as much reading as you think. My original fragmentation and curiosity dissolved into recognition. Oh, yes, this report is about my professional life, about asymmetries of power, about attempts by an ethical group of faculty to get the word out. That whereas there are some departments where faculty feel they share in governance, there are many where the opposite is the case. I share with you here three of the many comments included in the report. This is not comments that people had, but that were actually in the printed version or online. The first one literally made me laugh slash cry. My department is a shit show in a blender set on puree. The second I thought was truth as well. In units where faculty rate shared governance is not working, 
the perceptions of the executive officer and the perceptions of the faculty often differ significantly. As my daughter would say, that's totally new information slash not. And another one, in our department, we have no shared governance, which the Dean seems to approve of since at the five-year review for the head, this was repeatedly mentioned and the executive officer was renewed for another five years. In this university, there is no recourse for lack of, sh for lack of shared governance. Brackets, news flash. So I have here for you uh, the, the, the kind of clickbait in our official email. It says, I wanna share this with you. Click here, I did. And some of these kind of um, special remarks that came out of that. Immediately, I began to send and receive texts regarding this report. So as soon as I read it, my, my text began to kind of pop up and I also began to text back to people. Oh my God, I think comment on Paychex is mine. And this was sent to me by several people. So either they all submitted the same comment or they all feel that way clearly. Uh, quote, I found two comments that might come from colleague Y or another one from another university girl Welcome to UCXX. Or I just read that and I thought I was on my group text with some of my UXX colleagues. So people throughout the country were reading this and literally living it, funny and tragic. Welcome to my life. I've been asked to participate in this workshop and speak to methods in relation to power arrangements, shifting from micro to macro within a long durée project of decolonizing the academy applying theories of power to faculty meetings and navigating one's professional life in the academy, building a skill set that is not full of cliches. And I'm sorry, but striking a balance is a cliche because it's a, it assumes that a balance can be struck. And don't even get me started talking about the word resilience. I've been encouraged to talk about specifics that can be turned into tactics for survival. The AAUP report allows me to begin discussing these issues because it underscores the uneven terrain of power, bylaws, procedures, adherence, and the consequences that are unequally borne by different actors in the academy for not following the path. Our university has provost communications that deal with stuff such as tenure and promotion. Communication nine, that there at the bottom is promotion and tenure. When we're hired or when we hire somebody, we say to them, look at communication nine and begin filing your materials according to that template. To communication 27, which is about shared governance for academic units. We have actual policies that are posted and occasionally updated for all to see. So as Professor Molina Guzman said earlier, you can see that communication nine has been modified due to COVID and it's effective as of 2-12-21, okay. For all of you can log in and not log in, but just look at this on, the, on, on any website because there's no paywall to look at this, but there is a paywall to retrieve academic articles from the University of Illinois Library. As the AAUP report makes abundantly clear, however, the presence of policies does not guarantee that these will be followed. Furthermore, when policies and procedures are not followed, there is no guarantee that the department, college, or university will do anything about it. And following grievance procedures often, if not always, serves much more to label the grievant as a non-team player and thus re-traumatizes the grievant without any results. And some, the grievant is actually worse off for grieving. So tactile lesson, slash method number one. The presence of policies and grievance procedures do not guarantee their enactment of just or justice. And I also reference the great Professor Sarah Ahmed, whose book complaint will be coming out in September. Here is another faculty in this report saying, I can feel my blood pressure rising as I respond to these questions. Our department does not follow the bylaws in annual reviews. I sent a formal letter of complaint to the department head, dean and associate dean of the college. The only response I received was an email consensually thanking me for my concern. I considered filing a grievance and even contacted the campus academic HR. After consulting with Bill Bernhardt, who, if you do not remember, is the person, the vice provost who sent the clickbait, they told me that this was 
not a university HR issue. What the F, where do I go? So here's my tactile lesson slash method number one. The presence of policies and grievance procedures do not guarantee their enactment or justice. 1A, they do protect the institution. University grievance procedures protect the university and mark the grievance as dysfunctional. Which takes me to tactile lesson number two. We cannot assume rationality from university processes. In preparation for this and for this whole conference, I'm sure there were many questions. And one of the things that some people mentioned was, well, I just knew that if I said this and this would happen. And I thought, well, that's a rational process. But we cannot assume rationality from university processes. I wish we could. After all, isn't rationality the promise of the enlightenment? This is very important to know. It's a graduate student slash professorial equivalent of, you can't blame yourself for systemic and structural issues. Unfortunately, you, might find, you may find yourself in a professional culture where one plus one does not equal two. Seeking advice from rational people is only partly helpful because X and then Y does not get you to Z, like in algebra. I've been told, did you try this? Yes. Have you done that? Yes. And my personal favorite, this is a communication issue, which essentially sends it back to your lab as if your communicative skills are the issue rather than the irrationality of the situation, the racism of the institution, the colorblindness of well-meaning dominant culture colleagues. I have here two quotes. One of them, you're, saying, you're a sane person in an insane situation, something that Sue Curry Jensen one time told me, helped me get through a very insane situation. And the other one, which is something that my colleague John Narone says all the time, that's out where the buses don't run. And it's his way of letting me know, okay, you're already, you're again in that insanity area. So let's not take, try to make rational sense out of it. This is an institutional loop of no recourse and minimal responsibility, which protects the institution and uses us as human fodder. We have to remember that if faculty member agrees and there is a settlement, the payout does not come from that executive officer or dean. It comes from university insurance. In fact, chances are that if it gets to settlement, you'll have to sign a non-disclosure agreement. So nothing really changes. And I here have a ProPublica report where they found that seven faculty members in our university had faced sexual harassment accusations. And in many of them, the university had settled and they had given the, harass, the harassing faculty member a year off with pay. And there were non-disclosure agreements signed until the ProPublica report, okay? So now, so we do not know how many of these cases there are. As all we know are the ones that did not get to settlement, which makes it seem like it's not worth to grieve, which takes us back to the loop. So irrational world things such as faculty, including EO deans, not following, ignoring, or openly flaunting policies and procedures leads to nothing other than violation of your individual rights and dignity or those of a composite department or even college faculty. So this, I think, it's not, they don't always lead to nothing, but it's, it's important to know that this is the majority of the time the, what the outcome will be. The endless loop. Tactile lesson method three. Institutional memory is a thing. It's a powerful thing. To return us to geometries of power in the university, the hierarchy is real and the hierarchy protects itself. So material gathered in periodic reviews of executive officers, for example, is not necessarily used to change leadership, don't get confused, but to protect leadership. This is something I did not know when I began as an assistant professor. I feel like these reviews also gather information on faculty who speak out. And this gathering may be informal, but it is nonetheless circulated and stored in institutional memory. Switching to the field now. We're told that this workshop will include a skill building around two deliverables, historical timelines of professional organization and power maps of the field. So as a way to focus me, Anjali asked me, what do you wish you had known when you began to work? My first and immediate answer was, well, this is a small world. And getting smaller. Yep, yep. I actually have felt like Dennis Quaid lots of times. The field is small and getting smaller. 
I was just telling my students the time that, and this is a personal anecdote, that major scholar was delivering a lecture in our Levy's faculty center and was totally getting into cutting down the cats and leaves Dallas television show slash active audience research. I kept making gestures like this. And he kept smiling at me. After the lecture, he came over. I think he thought I was flirting with him. And I was just trying to tell him that in the front row, sitting right in front of him, was Tamar Leaf, whom he was cut down. So one of my undergrad students chatted when I was doing this on, on Zoom yesterday, I said, that is actually one of my nightmares. And I thought, wow, when I was an undergrad student, I never thought about stuff like that. So she is well ahead. Are there processes for making genealogies of, or mapping sites of power? The sites of power in universities, and uh, Rupali talked about these so wonderfully, uh, the way that we're ranked, are both official and unofficial. We must remember that the official bearers of power, executive officers, deans and provosts, come and go. And in the state of Illinois, a lot of them go because there's all sorts of weird, funky things that have to do with power and corruption. But there are people, the solid structure who never move, some of whom are actually incredibly powerful in the university. And the longer you're there, you probably should find out who these are. In professional organizations, the sites of power include paradigm wars. Some paradigms have more resources than others. And this is not always correlated to membership, something media scholars should readily recognize. Representation is not about numbers, but rather about power. In professional organizations and the divisions within, there are also powerful universities that have long histories in the field and or superior resources. I think it is a well-known fact, for instance, that in ICA, a particularly well-endowed school exerts power Faculty and alums are overrepresented as presidents, editors, and members and chairs of committees. Fun fact, in ICA until quite recently, committee membership was only known by members of committees. Since 2019, this has changed. Also, committee, member committee membership in ICA is appointed by presidents. I believe in NCA, there's a committee on committees that populates committee memberships. So maybe as more democratic process, ICA will eventually transition into a similar model. I don't know, I'm just putting that out there. Micro elements index power. For example, in conferences, numbers of sessions, location and timing of sessions differ according to the membership and prominence of a division or interest group. And this overlaps with Professor Molina Guzman. This can be become a chicken and egg situation. We're in a new division or interest group gets the Sunday 8 a.m. session in the annex to the hotel, and therefore not many people attend, which in turn serves as evidence of demand to the broader organization. Mobilization of membership addresses these measures. It's not impossible, but this requires literal organization. Social movement theory is helpful here. This applies also to nominations. Nominations for awards take time, but this time has to be spent. Also, it takes us back to populating committees in the organizations. They have to be populated in a democratic manner. Otherwise, paradigm wars, power, powerful groups, and possible outright discrimination prevail. And I am in a, in, a, in a selection committee at this time where there's a paradigm war and we can't seem to agree, but because we're not measuring on the quality of the submissions, but on their adherence to people's paradigms, which is unfortunate. Tactile method slash lesson number five, get those publications out. When I was at Penn State as an assistant professor, they assigned a mentor to me. Her name was Deborah Atwater. And she told me repeatedly, publish. Nobody can take your publications away. I did not realize how serious this bit of advice was because at the end of the day, nobody gives you credit for revising bylaws, et cetera. Get those pubs in. And do not fear that your stuff is not ready. I am here as a reviewer and former editor of Com Theory to let you know it's probably ready. And this is why I put this screen caption from uh, Michelle Obama's Becoming. She says, I have been in the highest committees in the land, all over the world, in palaces. And let me tell you, I don't know how those people got those seats, 
They don't know how they got those seats, but we belong in those seats. I'm here to tell you, your essay belongs in publication. Listen to Michelle Obama. This is why I try to engage grad students and junior scholars in reviewing. It gives you a great skill, aligning your vita. You know what's being written and or presented, but most of all, it shows you how ready your stuff is to be published. Because once you see what else is being submitted, you go, hey, my stuff is as good as that. Tactile lesson number six, elders and getting the word out. This is a screen capture from a movie that just came out three weeks ago on Netflix called Moxie. And Lucy, one of our protagonists, says, why aren't we reading Sandra Cisneros? And the football player in the back says, I thought that the great Gatsby was great. Okay, how can scholars effectively acknowledge the work of elders and allies? This is a question that applies locally. Again, in terms of the university or college wherein you function and more globally as in the field. It is much easier to identify the elders and the acknowledging of elders takes us into the field. In terms of organizing for the feminist studies division at ICA, for instance, I know that both Brenda Durbin and Paula Tricler came together with Lana Rakow, who was then a student and many others to make the case for a feminist scholarship interest group at the Hawaii ICA, which I believe was in 1996. I wasn't there. And then Lisa Kuklins and I, as co-chairs of the interest group, moved it to divisional status. All of this took a ton of mobilizing and labor and yielded results. Then we had to work on getting more program slots, better times, better rooms, and nominate for awards for edit edit editorships and officers. In terms of scholarship and the elders, nothing replaces a great lit review. Stop. I repeat, stop. S-T-O-P, thinking that you've just discovered a new field. Chances are you haven't. The Jennifer Lopez or I Discover Latinas and the Media phenomenon has faced me many times when I'm reviewing. And I've addressed this in some of my publications. I believe the actual quote in one is, stop planting your flag on my butt and do the research. We need to balance that acknowledgement of elders with welcoming and drawing on research from new scholars. Respect all I say. I still remember a conference a while ago where James Carey was in the panel. It was standing room only. But as soon as he spoke, most left the room, not bothering to listen to the other members of the panel, none of whom were of the elder category as Jim Carey, but all of whom deserve respect and to be listened. I want to complexify that elderly category. Until quite recently, and still the case in many situations, elderly is operationalized as white and male and Anglo-European. And even European is flattening. For an ICA, there are some European countries such as Germany, the Netherlands, Sweden, and Denmark that have far more salience than Spain, Italy, Portugal, and France. So when we say elderly, we really want to scratch beneath the surface and identify elderly scholarship that for a set of interlocking issues of exclusion are not included in the canon. The politics of erasure applied to both the elderly as well as to new scholars. I quote below two brilliant scholars who have published on this issue re recently. The fact that they have published on this issue itself is an indicator that our field is beginning to engage in a bed of expansive self-reflexivity to include a broader range of voices. Myra Washington in Woke Skin, White Masks, Race and Communication Studies says, I was shocked that so many in the field were shocked when word spread that there was so little diversity in terms of publications. Do they not look at faculty meetings, conference panels, keynote addresses and plenaries, the books on their shelves? Similarly, in the forum, forum introduction, communication and the politics of survival, Robert Mejia says, if you do not recognize our work, nor our experiences are legitimate, you are part of the problem because your willful, your willful ignorance is erasing our existence. I call this from my, one of my positionalities as a Latina media feminist, the Gloria and Saldua moment. When scholars in our field mention Gloria 
as a way to simultaneously nod to the existence of Chicana slash Latina feminism and to dismiss all other work within that area. There, I mentioned Gloria Anzaldúa. Are you happy now? I am happy to witness scholars in our field calling out these politics of erasure, which have material effects of, for scholars of color. If our research is not referenced, we will not be hired, tenured, or promoted. The politics of erasure not only impacts scholars of color, but also the entire field, as it remains woefully underinformed about issues that should be of central importance and reproduces the tedious narrative of US white exceptionalism. Finally, what else I was, you know, what else? What, what else do you know? You know, what, what else do you have here? And this is the last thing that I will get to. Cultivate allies. So many have told me, cultivate allies. And this has been very difficult. Or I have been, I have a really bad sense of who is an ally. This is not to say that I do not have allies. But I do want to admit that more often than not, I have erred. I have supported others who, as soon as they achieved their goals through me, have either stopped engaging with me or have actually turned against me. Also, some people change. They began as allies, and then as they have other roles, especially admin ones, they turn into different people. I had a great director once who constantly told us, quote unquote, the chip didn't take. And that was her way of telling us that the mythical chip that admin got as soon as they became admin, which made them turn against faculty and friends, did not take with her. So I do not in any way disagree with a tactile lesson method to cultivate allies. I obviously do not have, though, any tips for you on how to tell you when somebody's an actual ally and somebody's not. But I do have some tips. Find supporters in other departments, other universities, even other fields. At most, a unit of analysis from a personal one to an engaged but detached one. Colleague X in another university in a history department, for example, can cut to the chase and, and identify a tactic in your department as running down the clock. It wasn't until he said it to me, I'm like, oh my God, that's it. Or another colleague in another university says, oh yeah, that's the usual divide and conquer. You know, head of department, rallies all of the junior faculty and who really have no voice because they cannot say no I don't want to be in your team and then against the senior faculty stuff like that you know colleagues in the field in other universities also can collaborate with you or suggest and or facilitate resources allies can navigate the project of the fugitive academy not all admins are not allies but it is very difficult to be an admin and an ally because that really you know, exacts a toll both physically and mentally on them. But I just want to thank, you know, the universe, because I am so privileged to right now be talking about this in a panel of allies. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was fabulous. Um, I, I have so many thoughts and questions, but um, I don't, I don't want to take up too much space. Um, I want to bring together some themes here and then open us up for, for Q&A. Um, really wonderful presentations that I think provide us with um, helpful schemas for thinking about power as both institutional and interpersonal. Um, so the seminar that we had prior to this, I think, emphasized um, both of those as well, the individual experiences of the scholars that we are in community with, um, and also the structural power that surrounds that. Um, one thought that I keep having is that all of this is vital to the work of professionalization. And so many of our young scholars uh, don't have access to the type of uh, technical knowledge of mentorship, uh, resources, and so on that are required to navigate these spaces. Um, again, there are such there are such expectations put such enormous expectations put on uh, scholars of color that aren't put on other people. Um, I want to I alluded to um, Robert Williams work vampires anonymous in the previous session and I actually I want to return to it for a moment. Uh, his point in that piece is that we as scholars of color invest so much in our research because that is what our institutions and our colleagues demand of us 
uh, in terms of quote unquote excellence, that we have nothing left to give to our communities, um, that we don't have the energy to do the work that often we set out to do in the first place. Um, critical race theory, I think, uh, especially in its new newer turns, um, which are always, as you said, old turns, um, allow us allows us to see where um, the demands of our institutions, which, um, as you point out, are are often irrational or at least only rational through the organizing logics of whiteness and colonialism and racism and so on, uh, that they prevent us from doing the work that we want to be doing or could be doing. Um, I love what I think is an undercurrent here, focus on generosity, this notion that um, we are all juggling so much and we are often trained to do critical exercises in graduate school. We're taught to deconstruct, we're taught to uh, do the opposite of building. But what we find, I think when we get to the, the actual job is that the, the job is the opposite. It's the work of building, it's the work of training uh, in, a, in a generative sort of way. Um, so that's a reminder to me about how intertwined what you're talking about, um, these practices of the day-to-day -day are intertwined with the work of healing trauma um, and also recognizing that we can't really escape the structural inequality even when we get the R1 job, even when we get the PhD and so on and so forth. Um, so I think that the first uh, presentation does a wonderful job of locating our institutions at a 10,000 foot level. And the second one um, provides us some of the wisdom and humor I will speak for myself at the five foot level. So what I would like to do is, um, is think a little bit together about um, some of these ideas that you're introducing um, in terms of negotiating theory. So let me start with this question. I have two questions here um, and then I just, I wanna get us started and hopefully folks from the audience will, will jump in. Um, but how can graduate students and junior faculty find the communities and lessons uh, and skills that they need in order to navigate um, this, this work that we do? Where are those spaces and how can they find them on their campuses? Well, I think one of the one of this kind of links us a little bit to mentoring, right? Uh, in that every grad student has a committee, right? And hopefully, at the very least, one person in that committee, and hopefully the whole committee. But I know that's not always the case. Uh, will be, you know, team hashtag grad student, right? And so, so that when you when your former student becomes a faculty member somewhere that you will somehow at least put them in touch with a couple of people or help them, you know, put them, not him, them in touch or help them find or suggest venues, but also provide that kind of network. Because when you are in a situation, in, in a particular situation, one of the more helpful things I found was not just reaching out to people there, but the people elsewhere who are just giving you validation and support. And so you know, because if you find yourself in an irrational situation, then the people that are gonna tell you you're a sane person in an insane situation are not gonna be the ones that are in that same tornado of irrationality. They're gonna be other people uh, who might be somewhere else. So I, I would say that that's, that's one thing. And, and the same for grad students, I think, uh, the grad students that I'm getting uh, or that are coming our way, we, we, we hear, even if they're not in our department, right? Because we have many communication departments in most universities. We get emails saying, hey, my grad student just went. Uh, and you know, so we, we reach out to them and, and we say, hi, I know that I'm not in your department, but you know, here I am, come talk to me. Uh, this is what we're doing. I mean, in the olden days, I would say, come to the party, but you know, now it's none, none of that. Group. Well, yeah, so I, I have some ambivalence about this question because I'm thinking of the kind of work that Isabel talked about with, you know, creating a academic interest group and then division. And I have to say, um, I was in New Orleans at that conference. And when she approached, I was sitting probably drinking with some people and 
she seemed like this powerhouse person. So she had, she talked today about, you know, all of her sort of questions and misgivings and sort of insecurities as she did it. But, you know, the, the, the faking it till you make it sort of thing that I got out of what I saw Isabel doing at that conference, um, it stays with you, you know, this young person who's like changing the world. Um, I also want to remember uh, some of the things that Gollum started his thing with, to remember Stuart Hall's sort of, you know, call to uh, critical scholars that, um, you know, there is a world outside that the scholarship and the privilege of being in the professoriate needs to be answerable to in some way. And that's not just in the sense of a responsibility that's external to you, but that the, the battles ongoing in the world outside, they might be juvenating and rejuvenating and meaning making, meaningful making, and um, a place where there is the possibility of community, but you do it through um, work that brings your scholarship to this, you know, relevance, to make it relevant to the outside world. Um, I realize that not everybody's scholarship is necessarily inclined in that way, but if you're talking about transforming the academy, then clearly we agree about some of these questions about the political significance and the structural uh, intervention that we are trying to make. And some of that is outside. It's in the news reports of the day and in the, you know, the latest outrage and whatever is happening in France and Germany, you know, so it's not just in the US. So um, you know, clearly I've I've made different decisions. So um, it's less important to me to get everything I write published. <laughs> um, there are other, so part of what I was trying to do in, in my little mapping thing was to say that there isn't one model. There are established models and I wish many of us be in those uh, institutions and in those circuits, but there, it's not sort of, you know, if that's not the, the circumstance that you find that your career is in, that it's not, it's not as if you're out of options. There's other options. Um, you do it through, I, I happen to be very fortunate. I live in New York City and I'm part of the union faculty. So between the union, you know, the EO is, you know, there's a certain additional layer of oversight on questions like, you know, internal faculty governance, um, academic freedom, so on and so forth. It's not perfect. You know, unions are like remarkably sort of old fashioned institutions, plenty of racism, plenty of sexism to go around there. Um, but, you know, how do you survive? You survive by not thinking of this as one size fits all. How do you survive? You survive by um, making the work meaningful to uh, communities beyond, you know, tenure promotion, you know, like it, that's important. I don't mean to suggest it's not important, but that it also is meaningful outside in bigger ways. Um, so I was trying to sort of do a little bit of that was to open it out so that it's not just this one model of, of academic production. Yeah, I absolutely love that you've done that. I think um, what you said about the reality of the job market is true, right? Not everyone, just by sheer numbers, not everyone can have a research one job, um, but also there's a I mean, I think there's very much a critique inherent in that, in the Research One institution, um, that those institutions in some ways cultivate ego, right? They're about publishing a certain number of papers. They're about demonstrating excellence and then the excellence becomes a badge of honor. Um, and that is in some ways oppositional to what you're talking about. It is oppositional to class solidarity. It is oppositional to connecting with communities outside. We have to be very intentional about that um, and the practices of being ethical scholars lest we get, get washed away in the institution. I was teaching this week in my critical race theory class a piece on uh, British black power. And one of the things that struck me, this, this was an article about uh, political blackness that talked about um, the sort of ideological 
uh, conception of political blackness that allowed for multiracial coalition building. Um, and how that worked as a as a colonial uh, colonialism class based solidarity. So I've been thinking about that all week, you know, as I'm um, operating in a pretty, you know, separate from the community sort of institutional space, while also thinking about, well, how are we going to create this space uh, to bring as many people together as we can in this in this very strange moment? There is no question in there. I am um, I am just reflecting on the words that you said. Um, well, but I, I, it reminds me or urges me to also say that I read some of these, you know, critical histories of the Carnegie classification as I was putting this thing together for you. And um, the fields that have paid a very heavy price in order to meet those external sort of classificatory standards is the humanities. So we have really, really, uh, you know, um, uh, machined up the number of PhDs we produce but we have not similarly machined up the growth in faculties where you know, there might be jobs. So partly these, these classifications have also created this you know, horrific glut in humanities PhDs over the last 20, 25 years. Um, and so it's not at all surprising that there's this crisis of con contingent labor uh, because there's all these people with PhDs and there's not full-time you know, tenure track positions for them but there's plenty of exploitative, underpaid, utterly contingent sort of teaching positions. Uh, they're making, you know, less than a fifth of my salary um, and teaching many more students than I am. Uh, and this is where we're all headed. So anyways, so other models, other ways of putting a life together that's meaningful and that's an intellectual mm -hmm. life uh, and, and, and uh, an organic sort of intellectual, politically significant or salient life, you know. That's what I, my life has forced me to consider. And so I thought I would share that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, one of the ideas that I, I loved uh, here was, um, well, two of them. One is, is about the rationality of the institution. Um, or the irrationality of the institution, so to speak, right? We're so, sold this bill of goods. I think a lot of us are sold this bill, bill of goods that oh, if you just file the complaint, it will be resolved by the appropriate people, right? That are in charge of you and also the people that are doing the harassing or the violence or whatever the, the thing is we're talking about, right? Um, so there's that um, sort of reality. I think we all have to come to grips with at some point where we're like, oh, this complaint process leaves a few things to be desired, or um, we just did all this DNI work and um, or DEI work, and um, nobody seems to be invested in actually putting it into practice, right? These sorts of um, machinations. And then I also really like this. Li listen to Michelle Obama's sort of. Um, idea of, you know, who's at the table and why are they at the table? Um, and what is the structural power we're not talking about? So uh, one question I would like to um, ask um, of you is, and situated within the context of history, um, you know, how does history help us to maybe address this idea of imposter syndrome that seems to plague scholars of color? Are there ways uh, one, are there practical ways you can suggest for scholars of color to think about imposter syndrome? And two, might there be a role for history in that, for recognizing the work of elders and um, understanding ourselves in a different lineage, perhaps, than the, than the one the institution wishes to impose on us? It's a leading question. That's, we, we call that a leading question in, in law. In the, in the courtroom? Yes. yes very um, You know, if I was good at, at combating imposter syndrome, I would feel more comfortable with the question. So I have essentially made peace with the fact that um, when somebody gaslights me, I get gaslit. You know, it's very difficult for me not to go there with them. And, and um, these are old habits, difficult habits to break. Um, but I think some of the work that a conference like this is doing you know, like it has been transformative for me and my imposter syndrome to hang out with uh, later generations of scholars of color um, because it comes with a kind of guarantee that I am much less alone now than I used to be. 
Um, so, you know, we get, in, Angie and I get invited because, you know, we're in this slightly village elder, uh, although we're not Anglo and male and white, um, but we get put in these, in this position, but it's completely mutual. They just witnessing this, you know, generation after generation of like scholars coming up, it goes a long way to combating this idea of I'm probably talking rot because they are looking at me like I'm from another planet. Um, you know, when I, I, I wrote that thing for communication so white and it was fortunate because I got a fairly large number of email responses and reactions and Anjali, you put it on Twitter or something. And so this created a little bit of a thing. Uh, but some of the responses, I got this beautiful response from Lori Lopez, for example, and she said that when she talks to her graduate students and she reads a piece like that, essentially, this is a generation of graduate students who will come up with the idea that race has always been integral to the methodologies and the approaches and the conceptions of media and cultural studies. That, you know, this will not be a new, brand new sort of thing, an argument for somebody to make. But this has been sort of, at least for my generation, this somebody had to make this argument because it had not been made before. So I'm taking heart from the kind of work that you guys are doing, this conference is doing, and lots of other such sort of consortia gatherings are enabling to make us not, the, the space aliens in the room do not make us feel like our point of view is this absurd one, as opposed to theirs, which is the prototypical normal one. You know, when I say that the history of the brand is a certain kind of history of commodified otherness, people on my faculty are like, what are you talking about, right? So this kind of like space alienness. Anyway, so I don't have that much to say about it because I don't know, it's still happening, the recovery from uh, imposter syndrome. And I've been at it for a few years now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, well, I love that answer. I, I would guess that the audience is, um, you know, feeling some mixture of relief and horror, right? Relief that, oh, I'm not the only one experiencing imposter syndrome, imp experiencing imposter syndrome, but, you know, also Justice Sotomayor, I think, made the same admission of still having imposter syndrome and also the horror of, oh, I could be extremely successful, like I could make it to, you know, as you said, you know, that you have this um, sort of feeling like, am I a star at this? You know, I didn't get that memo sort of thing, uh, but also still have that imposter syndrome. So I think that's really important and helpful to realize. Um, and I love the way that you frame the histories here of thinking um, backwards and forwards, right? So we can think about histories and also what comes after in, in conversation with each other. Um, and I think you're absolutely right. It's a different feeling to be in a room where you're legible to everybody versus a room where people are looking at you like you have three heads. And I think one of the great opportunities for our grad students and junior faculty now is that there are more spaces where people are not looking at you like you have three heads. And that's helpful, helpful to manage that imposter syndrome. But I do think that it is very important to, you know, I don't, I don't know about imposter syndrome because I always feel like I agree with Michelle. You know, I'm sitting at a, mm -hmm. I mean, I was, I, I'm sitting at these committees and I'm like, why do you have three heads? Not why do I have three heads, you know? And it, maybe it's because I was born in Chile. So I'm like, just, you know, uh, I was at a committee two years ago university-wide level committee on international education and this major major professor full professor he just discovered india you know he goes you know there's india this large country they need education and we should think about this and i'm like this is it this is why i don't have imposter syndrome I just call to my memory that performance right there. And I'm like, and this is what, what, wait, 2019? And you're saying this in a research one committee at the university level. And you know, so, and this is why I want my students to review articles because I think that that really goes a long way towards that imposter syndrome because they're thinking my stuff is not good enough. And I'm like, let me tell you, 
I edit this stuff, just review it. And then they give it back and they go, wow, was that a real, was that for real? I'm like, yeah, that was, that was actually an article that submitted. And so I think that the more that I just, I, yeah. So I'm, I'm sorry if I sound discordant, but I actually go into these meetings and I think, you know, we all belong here. And I'm not the one that's discovering India in 2019. So don't you be looking at me like I don't know things, you know? Yeah. You go there and discover, what are you going to discover next? China? Oh my God, there's China. I mean, but that's just like a metaphor for what happens all the time. And why do we have an imposter syndrome? We do so much work. We know so much. I'm not, I, I just refused for that. I, I think that we, you know, I refuse that. Yeah. Well I, you I, have three heads. <laughs> <laughs> well done. I don't think that's discordant at all. I, I think that folks need to hear that, right? Like on the one hand, we have these conversations about labor, how so much labor is forced on us. On the other hand, there is this difficulty, I think, in translating that into an understanding of self that we're experts, right? And, and yeah. I would argue that there is this separation between people of color and this category of expertise that we seem to internalize um, and perhaps need to uninternalize, right? Um, and I think, it's, I think it's great that you put that into words because people need to hear that. People need to hear um, that those are actual things that happen um, and that being on the other side, right? Whether it's the other side of the classroom or the other side of the journal uh, reviews or conference reviews is really quite eye-opening um, as an experience. You know, this is why we have the word Columbusing, right? That's, this is why the, the Zennials and the Millennials have the shorthand for talking about these ideas because they're like, oh, well, or we're, I think we have come to a place where we're like, we're just going to shorthand that whole concept into one word. So absolutely. Um, so let me ask this. Um, the... One of the things that this panel was organized around was the concept of power. And I think both of you spoke beautifully to um, how power exists, whether it's in this like institutional hierarchy, we really wanna be, you know, and our, our research one or wh whatever they're calling them these days, institution um, or, um, you know, within departments, I wanna be the most published. Um, and there's an, there's an element to that of like, at some point we have to say to ourselves, we don't actually need to publish any more journal articles. Like we actually need to encourage the younger people to do that work, right? We don't need to take up more space um, in journals, sometimes repeating the same ideas that that's, that's about ego, not about uh, collaboration. So I'm wondering if you could speak very tangibly uh, to this idea of power and power mapping. Um, both of your presentations do this already, but if we could maybe very specifically speak about what the sites of power are in departments, in institutions, um, in colleges, right? What, where are the landmines? And um, how do we um, learn to navigate those landmines, both at an institutional level and a disciplinary level? This is a question that I have brilliant junior colleagues in my department, and they teach me every day. Uh, there's a sense in which um, maybe because they're, you know, they have to be more careful, and so they are more vigilant about these things. Um, but you know, the the decision to speak up in a faculty meeting versus the decision not to speak up. And people have done both things. Um, the decision to speak up is more memorable than when, it's, when you don't, uh, but not in a detrimental way. Um, I mean, I, had a, I have a junior colleague who we had a job candidate in the room and I think I or somebody had asked a question about, you know, how race figures in their sort of schema. And they had said that it doesn't really because of some complicated reason. And so this other junior person, also a person of color, 
had essentially, you know, the thing where the neck becomes red and then the lower cheek becomes red and then the face, it was one of those kind of moments. And it was a decisive moment because um, this person was definitely not going to get hired in the department. So I remember this story to say that on the one hand, there are risks, you know, to speak up, but then every once in a while, um, there are things that I really want to hear from my junior colleagues. And it's my responsibility to corral other less friendly seniors to not sandbag them as a consequence, you know? So what, why else do I occupy all of the committee positions that I do occupy is to, you know, make it a little smoother for the juniors that I have some say over their lives in the department. Um, I don't know if that says anything for what we talked about, but that would be one play, you know, like there's a lot of crisis around, should I speak up or should I not speak up? Well, there are people in the department who are committed to making sure that that is not an expensive choice for you, um, you know. Well, that's incredibly helpful, I think, um, in, in saying that there are people that are already perhaps in these positions of power that are trying to facilitate the success of other people. I also, you know, I think that probably every person of color, um, every, every person that has a structurally marginalized group kind of shares the experience of that moment where their face says everything they're not saying out loud. Um, and one, one of the great things about having this Zoom moment is the ability to turn off the camera when that face appears, right? So there's a little bit more protection between the emotional experience that you're having and the reading of it in the room. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, sometimes even when we don't speak up, we do, we, we have um, nonverbal communication that happens that very clearly um, communicates what we're, what we're thinking. Yeah. I think it's very difficult to power map, you know, I, I really do. I, I, I hesitate to, yeah, I hesitate to even say anything because, and it sounds like Rupali, you're in a more or less functional, rational situation, which, you know, makes for a different kind of power mapping because as a junior faculty, you can say, well, I'm allowed to speak, I can speak and I, and I can feel or I have been told in no ambiguous terms that the senior faculty support that input. I would argue that much more often that's not the case. Departments don't function that way. And so junior faculty mm -hmm. have a very, very difficult time. So again, that's why I share that, that report with you all. So one of the things that I know is happening and let's say another department in that same building that you see behind me is that there's just such polarization created by the executive officer that the, the senior faculty don't dare to speak to the junior faculty because if they do, the executive officer will see that as a sign of allegiance and then react, right? So what this means is that the junior faculty cannot speak to the senior faculty and vice versa. And they're all scared of the consequences. And that to me seems so tragic for everyone involved, except for the EO, right? For everyone involved, because there can be no collaboration, no mentoring, uh, no reaching out. And, and so in that situation, what keeps happening is a revolving door, of course. The junior faculty, if they can, they get out. Right, And many times they make the decision, Rupali, of leaving a research one university to go to a non-research one because it's been such a traumatizing experience. So we're losing these wonderful scholars, but also the senior faculty are incredibly traumatized. So I don't, I don't know what to do. You know, I, 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 don't, I don't know how to help in that situation. Uh, I can't clearly, I'm not in that department. I'm friends with the senior faculty clearly and I can give them a nice bottle of wine so we can get through it for another semester. But, you know, it's the sites of power. Mapping are difficult to do in these situations. I agree what you said earlier in, in your talk though, Angie, you know, write, publish. It's a way to build an armor to protect yourself, you know? So if at all, 
you know, if the institution encourages it, enables it, right, focus on the work, uh, one way to build up some, you know, layers of protection. Absolutely, it's the currency of the academy, right? And um, I, I like to think about this sometimes in terms of making it more costly for the institution to come after you than to work with you, right? And if you are published, it's a little bit easier. It's another, um, I guess, a tool in your toolbox to negotiate the difficult situations. Yeah, even though we are skirting with that horrible sort of admonition that, you know, women, people of color have to do twice the work, but in many ways we do do twice the work. Mm -hmm. um, if you're gonna do the work, you know, maybe you do it as a kind of vaccine from, you know, mm -hmm. the irrationalities that Angie's talking about. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so I am very grateful for the time that you have given us today. Um, I would like to just close by giving you the opportunity to share any last pieces of wisdom that you might have. One question, which I, you know, I think that you've sort of touched on already, um, might be to share a lesson that you wish you had known, um, say, when you were a graduate student or a junior scholar, or a piece of wisdom that one of your mentors or elders shared with you that you think the whole world needs to know. Um, but I would just like to close on that and give you the opportunity to share anything that we perhaps haven't covered. Um, and of course, there's a lot we haven't covered, but approximately within the conversation that we've had. It will be uh, reworking uh, stuff that's already come up, but you know, this, so it's, and it's related to the imposter syndrome thing is, you know, it's, it's, a, it's one voice. We are limited in our intellectual frameworks into not believing in singular authorities and singular histories and you know, one way of seeing the world and so on and so forth. But um, there is expertise, there is hard work, there is a lot of preparation that has gone into your capacities to hold this job um, and that to not, you know, forget that, do not forget that yours is not just, you know, as good an opinion as, you know, the student in your classroom or, you know, the guy who's discovering India in 2019, <laughs> but that um, there's reasons for why you are in this job. And, you know, if you can bear to trust those reasons a little bit. Um, yeah, that's it. I, I, I should have trusted myself a lot earlier in my career than I did, I think is what I would say. Um, there's no reason for me not to have trusted myself more earlier. That's so true because we all trusted you a long time. Ago. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. I would have followed you till the end of the earth like two decades ago. So I don't know. You know, now I find out you had imposter syndrome. I'm like, I was following her, and I and I thought other people had three heads. So, uh, so what I, I I think that the third point in my last PowerPoint was like. You know, you get your joy, you need to have a life outside of academia. I think too many people think that, that you know, that, that that's where your joy comes from. And that's, that's, that, you know, academia is a job and the institution is heartless. They don't care about us. And that's really good to know because then you're like, oh, good. So my happiness, you know, does not come from dealing with the institution, right? And so there was one time when there was a bunch of crap going on and somebody sent me to the office of women's affairs which I find always very funny you know that I forget what the name of it is but that they have one they don't have one of men's affairs but they have one of women's affairs you know and what she said to me is everything that's happening is totally legal I hate to tell you everything they're doing is totally legal so harassment and bullying totally legal and in that she goes but I'll tell you what I have found drives them crazy and I'm like, what is it? She goes, when you're happy, can you manage to be happy? If she said to me, if you can manage to be happy, if you cannot do it, perform happiness around them. So, but I'm like, but I am happy. She goes, then just stay happy. And that is just like your biggest, you know, victory that through it all, you managed happiness. And I think I wish that for everybody 
to try to manage happiness because yeah, because that's important. And that makes you a better everything. It makes you a better professor, a better colleague, and a better scholar. Yeah, that's true. That's a beautiful place to end. I cannot add anything worthwhile to that, I think. So let's end there. Thank you so much to both Thank of you, you for um, this conversation. Um, I think I speak for everyone when I say that we're grateful for it. Thank you to you guys. Thank you. Beautiful job. Bye, guys.